Well, good morning and welcome again. Unless you've been hibernating in the Colorado Rockies, you know who Tom Finkelpearl is, but in case you have been living under a rock, I'm gonna give you a very, very quick introduction so Tom can come up and um, then after he addresses us, be on his way. He is the art czar or commish, um, more precisely the commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. And in this role, he oversees city, city funding for nonprofit arts organizations across the five boroughs and directs the cultural policy for the city of New York. I can't even imagine um, what that is, is like. Most of us remember him as the executive director of the Queens Museum for 12 years, starting in 2002. He is also the author of two books. The first one is Dialogues in Public Art, published by MIT Press in 2000. And his second book is What We Made, Conversations on Art and Social Cooperation from Duke University Press in 2013. And that's a particular favorite of mine, um, not just because Houston's Project Rope Houses is on the cover. And I think some of us in the room, including Allison Green, um, remember those days. We're just old enough to remember scraping the paint um, and getting those houses, those marvelous houses ready for their new lives in Houston as um, art exhibition spaces as well as communities for single mothers. And so without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to Tom Finkelpearl. Thank you so much for being here and welcome. Can we turn down the lights for the slides? So I just wanted to start by set, sort of describing what the Department of Cultural Affairs does. Um, so we're a funding agency, and we're the local funding agency, the second largest funding agency for the arts in America after the federal government. There's the Department of Cultural Affairs of New York City. We oversee about $300 million a year of grants. About half of it is capital and half of it is expense. And when I say capital and expense, capital is donations to capital projects all over the city. We're working on about $850 million of capital projects at arts organizations right now in 225 different sites. The biggest investment that we have at the Department of Cultural Affairs is something called the Cultural Institutions Group. That is a group of major cultural institutions and smaller ones throughout the city, but one <clears throat> famous one, which is the first one that was founded in New York City, is the Museum of Natural History. 1869, it opened, and there was a deal, and the deal was, we'll give you the land, we'll build the buildings, we'll give you some basic operating money, and you run a private nonprofit. So it's sort of halfway in between the European model, which is the public museum, and the American model, which is most of what you guys work at, I would guess. <clears throat> which is the private. So with funding from the city for 100 and almost 150 years, the Museum of Natural History is, you know, now has this big campus, and it has a kind of special relationship with the city. Anybody, everybody from New York City went there as a kid, right? Is there anybody from New York City who didn't go to natural history on school trips? 365,000 public school kids per year go to the Natural History Museum. In the first contract that I've seen between the museum and the city from 1879, I have a facsimile in my office, there's a specific mention that the public school teachers of New York City are going to have special access to the museum's collection. So building on that uh, collaboration, that real publicness of these museums, but also keeping them independent from any sort of real city control, we've built this incredible group of cultural institutions. We're sitting in one now. I'll get to that in a minute. But they are, uh, what's going on here? Okay, so there's the Museum of Natural History, there's PS1 Contemporary Arts Center, this is Warm Up, which is maybe second only to the Brooklyn Museum's first Saturdays as a party at a museum. Uh, this is a DJ party that happens every Saturday at the museum. At the, at, so it's everything from a natural history museum to a contemporary arts center. Uh, the Botanical Garden next door to us here is under cultural affairs. The botanical art gardens, the zoos are, are under us as well. These are, again, part of the cultural institutions group. We had a 
bit of a problem at the Botanical Garden. The last couple of weekends, they had 140,000 visitors between the two weekends. They had 80,000 and 60,000. So that's actually too many. I don't know if anybody from Brooklyn was there, but we're a little concerned about that. I think it's going to calm down. I think it was part of it was the terrible winter we just had. But part of it was this incredible organization and the cherry blossoms are quite attractive. Um, again, the zoos are under us, the Bronx Zoo, the uh, Staten Island Zoo. The Bronx Zoo has locations. There's a, a zoo right here in the park, um, in Prospect Park. So you're sitting in one of these institutions, the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, again, a 19th century institution is part of the cultural institutions group. So a lot of the capital money, for example, that went into building this auditorium, I'm sure if Arnold were here, he would know exactly the number, uh, went into it. We're the biggest supporter. Uh, I am essentially the landlord of this institution, but the landlord on behalf of the city of New York. So that's sort of what my job is here. Uh, and as Arnold said, obviously, one of the things that Brooklyn Museum has done brilliantly is to connect with its local community. And I'm going to talk about how we attempted to do that at the Queens Museum as well. And just for full disclosure, you're going to go upstairs and see the Kende Wiley show. My wife is a curator here, and she organized that show. <laughs> um, so, but that, I, that's also been you know, like one of these big hits. It sort of transcended uh, the museum world into popular culture. So my, uh, I'm going to start talking about the Queens Museum, what we did there, sort of both organizationally and curatorially. And then I'm going to talk about how that transcended or translated into my current job at Cultural Affairs. So the, the building uh, was a building built for the 1939 World's Fair. It's in a park. In the background, you see Philip Johnson's New York State Pavilion, again, from the 65 Fair, 64 Fair, 65 Fair. And, you know, it's a kind of tough location. It's, uh, you know, when Arnold said that he had to, at a certain point, forget about Manhattan, it's really actually extremely easy to get here from Manhattan. I mean, every, a lot of us came from Manhattan today, right? And how long did it take? It takes like, you know, by the time you leave Manhattan, you're here in 15 minutes. That is not the case at the Queens Museum. It's not a symbolic problem. It is an actual transportation problem. So I have no sympathy. You know, when you get to the stop here, it says Brooklyn Museum subway stop, right? When you get to the subway stop in Queens, it says Flushing Meadows Park. And then it's a 15-minute walk if you know where you're going. If you don't know where you're going, it's about an hour walking around the park, yeah, which happened often. So we had to figure out. Now, having said that, it's also at the symbolic center of Queens. So there's the Unisphere there. Anybody ever been to the US Open? Yeah, you've been to the US Open. So that's where we are. It's right next to that. People never, I've never heard somebody say, you know, I don't go to the US Open, it's too far away. It's not too far away. It's, it's the thing that has a very clear sense of what it is. There's nothing else like it in, in America. And you can get there. That's our uh, parking lot for the Queens Museum was VIP drop-off for the US Open. So if you're a, you know, if you came in a limo, that's, you came right to the Queens Museum and you walked in. Uh, but, but nonetheless, we had this problem over and over again that people felt it was too far to get there. People felt it was too far to get there. Who were the people? And those people were uh, people who live in Manhattan, people for whom this wasn't easy to get to, where it wasn't the center of their universe. So we had to understand that, and I think everybody in the room has to understand that about your own museum. So what is it that you can do that relates to the people for whom your museum could become the center of the universe? We did have one thing far and beyond what anybody else in this room has, which was a panorama of the city of New York. Uh, if you don't get the scale, this is a school group up here. Hey, by the way, is there any way to get the one place in this room that's light still is up here? So if there's anybody listening, if we can get, get these lights down a little bit more. Oh, OK. Is that? Yeah. Anyway, you can see the slides well enough, I suppose. Ah, it's getting better. OK, so we had this 9,500 square foot model of New York City. These, this is Manhattan. This is Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx. It, it was built by Robert Moses for the 1964 World's Fair. It took 100 people three years to build. It had been updated once. When we updated it, we made 65,000 changes. And this was you know, this incredible thing which drew people in. So if you're anybody from Queens, 
Right. When you were a kid, did you go to the panorama? Many times. There you go. Thank you very much. This, she didn't say it here. But, uh, so again, it was that same thing that Arnold said in a way about Brooklyn and how the education department kept the museum connected to the community. We also had, we had this incredible thing. And by the way, before I became director of the Queens Museum, this was the thing that brought me to Queens. So I'd go out there, I'd go to a Mets game, which is nearby, and I'd bring my friends by and say, this is an incredible thing, you have to see it. And then I would, you know, go upstairs and there would be a Mel Chin show or some other cool show. But the attraction for me was always that, the panorama. So we had this one thing to build around. We had an incredible education program. And then at a certain point, you know, after my many years, we had the opportunity to rebuild the museum, to rebuild a, a second part of the museum, which used to be a hockey rink. And we hired the architecture firm Grimshaw. And in the process of all those years of sort of understanding who we were, where we were, we understood that we're in the most culturally diverse place in America with 138 languages. I will counter anybody who says they're in a more diverse place. Uh, and by the way, I have a long answer to why I'm right about that. Um, <laughs> but what we decided was that there were certain ways in which we could do something that wasn't being done elsewhere. And we honed it down and honed it down to the point where we decided that our one-word mission statement needed to be openness. So we had already uh, established one of the top art therapy programs. Uh, we had art therapists on our staff, two art therapists with a full-time dedicated space uh, for a program called Art Access. That was something we could do better. We, we could excel at that. We started to program with the Brooklyn Public, I uh, Brooklyn, the Queens Public Library System. We worked with something they have uh, there called the New New Yorkers program. The Queens Library System is the cultural institution in America, I believe, that's best connected with immigrant communities. When you walk into your library, by the way, those folks from Queens, I will say, you did, you were a member of your library, yes? Okay, even if you hadn't been to the Queens Museum. You remember they have 66 branches, they're all over Queens. If you're from Bangladesh and you walk into the library in your community, they have the paper from your part of Bangladesh ready to go, because they've got dem demographers on their staff, they understand the communities, they understand the immigration patterns, they know when the Bukharans are moving to Forest Hills. They know which uh, groups from Central Asia are, are uh, Central Asia are the staff at their uh, European delis, as they're called. Et cetera. So we had to figure out how to connect to all these different communities, and one of the ways to do it was through the library system. So we started a program in which we were teaching classes relevant to those communities in native tongue at their branch library for the first four sessions. And the second four sessions were at the Queen's Museum. So we, stopped, we taught extensively in Mandarin, in Korean, in Spanish, a lot. Uh, <clears throat> but we also taught in, in Hindi, and in, in, in Bengali, and Urdu. Uh, there were even uh, some other Chinese dialects. So that meant that we were coming to people on their terms and introducing them to the museum. This is Queens. <clears throat> I mean, New York City is very diverse, but there's nothing more diverse than, than that graphic. <clears throat> and then within Queens, within Latino, or within Hispanic, and within Asian, there was a tremendous amount of diversity. So one of the things that we also realized is you can't do everything. If you try to connect with all those communities, you will fail. So if you do the Korean show followed by the Ecuadorian show followed by the uh, Filipino show, one after the next, you're going to get a good audience for that group, and then they're not going to come to the next show. So we decided we had to find large-scale connections to particular communities and do the shows over and over and over and over again to the point where it became their place. So, you know, we were obviously... Um, thinking about ourselves almost as the United Nations. Ironically enough, the United Nations General Assembly had met in our building. This is the UN in, in our building before they moved to Manhattan. So there was actually kind of this UN connection. And one of the ways that we uh, thought about ourselves was that uh, UN. And then uh, not long after the uh, reopening, there was an artist from Mexico named Pedro Reyes who reenacted the UN. So this was a thing where we had such connections through the library system to a lot of different communities in Queens. 
And we had that UN history that reenacting the UN and the People's UN was a sort of natural thing to do. So people may have participated in like the model UN, but in the model UN, I could represent Cyprus and you could represent Peru. In the People's UN, you actually had to be from that country. So we had to go out and find people, mostly from Queens, but not exclusively, who were from all the different member states of the United Nations. And what Pedro Reyes then did in this uh, sort of performance was say that we all know that diplomacy is not working that well, right, in the United Nations. I mean, maybe it's working as well as it can. But he had um, this idea that, that things like psychotherapy or, or uh, theater games would be an interesting way to enlist different kinds of communication mechanisms. So we hired, uh, this is the uh, member of the Urban Bushwomen, uh, to be the sort of moderators of this two-day event. And this is Pedro then standing with, uh, I think, a couple of Mongolians and a woman from Kazakhstan. Um, so it was a, a moment in which, after all these years of working with all the different communities of Queens, we could bring people together in a communicative, almost sort of utopian adventure. Um, but it was only after working extensively with the library system, with, the, with actually the uh, UN, uh, United Nations Association in Queens, that we could come to the point of being able to find people from, I think, 140 different countries uh, to come together and try to solve the world's problems, which was unsuccessful. <laughs> um, but it was a try. So again, to go back to this, you know, I wonder if there are probably people, a lot of people in this room, where if you look at the number, you know, 613,000 Latinos, or five, that's probably more than the size of the city that a lot of people come from. So within those communities, you know, if you go back and you just look at, you know, like, oh, who are we going to focus on? 39% of the Asian population in Queens is Chinese, and we did a lot of Chinese programming. And some of it was simply a matter of, you know, going to China. This is Yu Min Jin, who was, you know, this is his first museum uh, exhibition in the United States. And it turned out that Yu Min Jin was sort of something of a celebrity in Flushing in the local Chinese community. So the opening took place mostly in Mandarin. Uh, people were running out to him, with getting his autograph, and he was like chatting away. We had a wonderful uh, dinner. Uh, afterwards at a local uh, Sichuan restaurant in which it was like, you know, the Mandarin speaking tables and the rest of us. Um, and that led to a whole other series of collaborations. This is a show that just uh, closed not long ago with the Politier Forum office. By the way, this was one of the most important aspects of the Queens Museum renovation as well, which was to put this huge sign facing the Grand Central Parkway which has hundreds of thousands of people driving past the museum every day. So just the billboard was important. But this figure here, this uh, figure on the outside of the museum, by the way, the, the artist said, we love it because the building looks like it could be from North Korea. He <laughs> <laughs> wasn't crazy about that. After spending $70 million renovating it. <laughs> so they put up the uh, figure, and this is actually not... Uh, any individual person. It's, it's a composite photograph of the five members of Palacier Forum, which is uh, Song Dong and Hong Hao and Yu Jin Wan and a couple of other people. And what they did in the center of the space was create something that was actually quite familiar. If anybody's been to China recently, they have the uh, exercise equipment that's in every park was there, and then they did a series of installations. Uh, I do want to say also that, you know, we... Uh, Sometimes I've gone through this presentation. I was in um, Europe uh, not long ago, and they were saying, do you do any, any ever done a show with an artist and anybody that we've ever heard of? And uh, I'd say, well, yeah, we, we also did that. And so this was a wonderful show, uh, which actually Ellen Holtzman helped to uh, fund, um, which was... In the 1964 World's Fair, Andy Warhol did a disastrous uh, public art project called America's Most Wanted Men. It was right next to where the museum is now. And we did a, uh, uh, we brought together those uh, paintings and we did a uh, show about that. So this was, uh, again, one of our reopening shows. But again, it was site specific. It was about the memory of the fair. For a lot of people in Queens, I think it had as much to do with the fair as it had to do with Andy Warhol. This is a map, uh, model of the 1964 World's Fair, which showed you exactly where 
the pavilion was upon which Warhol did this disastrous project. And it was contextualized with a bunch of other um, you know, Warhol work from the period. So even after those many years of sort of studying the community um, and understanding sort of the demographic relations that, you know, and the flows, I felt like I didn't know who actually was coming to the museum well enough. So again, with this idea that this, the whole architecture of the space was based around that idea of our single word um, uh, openness being our, our mission statement. And so I set up a ping pong table in the lobby. And on weekends, I would go in and play ping pong to figure out who was coming to the museum. And so what I, what I realized was that you don't actually talk to people when you're playing a game. So I just warmed everybody up obsessively. You want to play a game, play with somebody else. And so I'm playing the game. By the way, I'm a very good ping pong player by sort of American museum standards. <laughs> um, I played on my college team. I'm not, you know, there's a lot of, let's say, Asians coming in who, for whom I wasn't particularly great. But uh, so I'd be playing, yeah, so what radio station do you listen to? How do you hear about the museum? You know, where do you live? How did you get here? All these kind of just quiz questions and really got to understand sort of who was coming to the museum in a way and who wasn't. And I think that one of the... Um, uh, things that we had decided, not just from playing ping pong, but sort of understanding for over all those years of research, was that if you were looking at this uh, group from Queens, that you know, the, the very large Latino population was much more newly arrived than the other population. So that a lot of the Asians had been uh, an African American, uh, certainly um, communities had been there for a long time. But a lot of the um, Latinos, particularly in our part of Queens, were coming from Ecuador and uh, Mexico. There had been a, a sort of older generation from Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, followed by the Peruvians and the Colombians, and the Ecuadorians and the Mexicans were flowing in very quickly. And they were not necessarily coming from places in Mexico where there are a lot of museums. They were coming from Puebla, sort of out in the country. And so one of the things we realized was that we had to do even more to connect to those communities than we'd done for the other communities. So over the years, we developed a relationship with a particular corner of Queens. This is uh, called Corona Plaza. It's 103rd Street and Roosevelt Avenue. And we started programming there over and over and over and over again. And this is actually after um, the city sort of took notice and demapped the street into a really beautiful pedestrian environment. So in this particular slide, you have in the foreground this sort of uh, hipster artist project, which is a mobile library. In the middle is a um, group from the community. It's a native dance group. And in the back are a series of tents, which are actually not very well attended at this particular moment uh, of the uh, festival, maybe because so much is going on here. And those are tents in which you can get advice about health care, in which you can, you know, immigrant rights groups are there, uh, domestic violence prevention, uh, et cetera. So the social service organizations were partnering with the museum by this time. And the reason that, that those events were always successful, first of all, is that there's a subway station right here. And so even if it rained, you know, a couple of minutes later, hundreds more people would get off. Um, but we also made the decision at a certain point to hire community organizers on our staff. And one of the things that community organizers know how to do is to connect with the community. And that's actually not something the art world is that good at. Uh, the art world, the expertise in this room is not knocking on doors and asking people what they're interested in, right? So that is, there is this profession. And you know, whatever you think about Obama as a president, he's an extremely good campaigner because he started as a community organizer. And he knows how to connect, right? So we, um, I had this weird uh, moment in which we were hiring somebody to work on this plaza. And a couple of you know, different people were coming in, and they're like, I'm really interested in socially engaged art, and I'm, I'm, you know, I can do it. And then a woman walked in and said, oh, I'm a community organizer. And me and the other person who were uh, interviewing was like, wow, yeah, community organizer. What's this all about? And I never have done this before since in an interview. I said, can, I'm just going to leave the room for 15 minutes. Can you come up with some sort of an idea of how a community organizer could work at a museum? And so we left and we came back. And I mean, can you imagine that? It's a terrible thing to do. Um, and she'd get, gotten on a Blackberry and she said, oh, here are the groups in the community. 
<clears throat> my community organizing mentor said, you're going to get to the parents through the kids, and I'm going to connect with the schools. And, you know, I know the elected officials in the community. She actually run a campaign for a, a city council member. Um, and so we said, okay, you're hired. And by the way, fluent Spanish speaking, I wanted to mention also that when I got to the Queens Museum, we didn't have a single person on the upstairs staff who spoke Spanish as their first language. That uh, is in a community uh, in Corona, which is officially the community we're in, um, in which it's heavily dominated by uh, Spanish speaking. So Nayla Rosario was our first community organizer. We had a number of them since then. And what she did was transform the way that we looked at that site uh, from a sort of a, 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 an event site to a site of engagement. And there's a difference between outreach and community engagement. And I think that that's something that <coughs> museums have to learn. I think museums are learning. If you talk about outreach, the idea is that we're in here and you're out there. As soon as you were, use the word out, you're creating a differentiation between yourself and your community. If you talk about engagement, you're talking about something that's more equal and more connected. Community organizers are involved in community engagement, not outreach, in my opinion. So again, there's the hipster uh, library. Uh, by the way, this is one of these cool moments. And, and by the way, the woman who took this photograph is a member of a coalition at Immigrant Movement, which I'm going to get to later. But uh, if you look at these uh, parasols, that you know, it's turned out to be this super sunny day, and the artists you know, being artists said, what can we do that's going to visually connect? And, you know, they just ran into a store and bought these parasols for a dollar each. Um, but again, there's the Native dance group, and there's, you know, obviously a lot of interest. And by the way, the folks involved in that group, uh, not all of them speak Spanish, right? That they're speaking Andean languages, which are some of the many 138 languages spoken in Queens. Uh, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. So one of the questions that I uh, was thinking about, and this relates in a little bit to the uh, question before about sort of popular shows versus shows that relate to art history. So I, it's sort of my opinion that, that the avant-garde right now in the arts has moved away from the object to the interactive moment. And that's what my book is about, the uh, artist, or, uh, what we made. Uh, and that, that the interactive moment in the gallery, so to look at a museum when the museum is closed doesn't tell you much about the show. So if you're going to go up and see the Kennedy Wiley show today at noon, that's great. But if you could come back on Saturday and see what it's like when people are actually here, that is, I think, what museums are about today. So let me just talk a little bit more about that, and then I'm going to get into my, how this translate into, uh, translates into my job. So one of the things we did in Corona, we were doing these art projects over and over again at, at that Corona Plaza. And these were successful art projects, and people liked them. But at a certain point, our community organizers went out there and said, yeah, what is it? What do you want that you know, can make this even better? And we kept hearing back in, uh, from the community over and over again, these art projects don't last long enough. You know, they might be up for a month or something like that, or two months. And which, by the way, is great. I love that. It's like, you know, instead of you need to change what you're doing, it's like we like these things so much they shouldn't come and go. So we uh, listened to that, and, and as fate would have it, an artist named Tanya Bergera was looking for a place to do a project, and she and Creative Time and Queens Museum together imagined this project called Immigrant Movement. Immigrant Movement has been going on for three and a half years. It's a storefront in Corona. It's there today. You can go visit um, and what it is, is kind of a think tank for issues around immigration. It's a community center. It is a place where um, it started out with this idea that it was going to be a political party, which turned out to be completely illegal. Uh, so we told Tanya she couldn't do it. In fact, you know, you can lose your 501c3 status for being directly involved in uh, politics. So this was like, yeah, forget it. Um, but so then she said, okay, if it can't be a political party, maybe it could be a movement. Uh, and so the folks at the at Immigrant Movement, the group that's sort of running it at this point, the last month, uh, this group of mothers, said it went from a, a party to a movement to a family. 
So this is an event. This is Tanya sitting on the floor on the ground here. These are a couple of people that have worked for her there. These are all participants in the project. Um, and, and this is, you know, a, one of the poorest places in New York City. Uh, it's a place with high employment and, and very low family income. These are people, families who are, are working at low in, uh, minimum wage jobs, a lot of undocumented people. But that is an incredibly active place, which includes everything from exercise classes to learning English through feminist art history <laughs> to... Um, there was a time at which a group of Taiwanese women who had been involved in a series of programs at the museum said, you know something? We are living in New York City. We need to learn Spanish. So they, uh, at this event that I was at, they had, that was the first time that the Taiwanese woman got up in front of this Latino group and spoke in Spanish, which was the most incredible, you know, positive reinforcement moment across communities that I'd seen in a long time. In any case, the other thing that, that happened there was these sort of, uh, this image up here is uh, Tanya Bergeris image, but this is Tanya again. This is Julissa Ferreras, who's the city council member. This is me, Rick Lowe over here, which I'll get to in a second. So this was a, a, an idea of the investigation of the idea of arte util. And arte util is loosely translated into English as useful art. But the idea, uh, apparently, I don't speak Spanish, that arte util also means art that is a tool. So the question that you know, Tanya was thinking about all the time, this is an art project in the form of a community center, in the form of a movement, and it's the interactive participatory moment that is the art. There's no object made there. Uh, actually, there's a moment in which uh, we had sent some painters over there, and they were about to paint the walls white, and Tanya completely freaked out and made them start over because she thought it was going to look too much like a gallery. Um, in any case, so that uh, idea of the long-term engagement, of the engagement that is social, that's political, that transcends, that uses art to bring people together to those big events, that uses uh, uh, social services as a, a sort of interactive moment, also to bring people into the art project. That's what the immigrant movement was all about. And um, again, this being Rick Lowe right here, one of the uh, great heroes. People know Project Row Houses. This is what you were just referring to earlier. So Project Row Houses is a social art project in Houston that started out uh, in a series of row houses uh, organized by this guy, by Rick and some other folks, a bunch of artists. And it's become sort of, a, it was described as Les Dumas al d'Avignon of social practice in, in America. <laughs> uh, that was Christian Ververes Fon and the Village Voice. So one of the things that Rick did, and you know, my playing ping pong is, is actually just a shadow imitation of what Rick does, is he is this very active, uh, practice of playing dominoes with folks in the community to figure out what's going on. And I think that that idea of connecting to people in a way that's sort of casual, that's not uh, a forum, that's not a speech like this, but it's an interactive social moment is one of the great parts of his genius. By the way, he is officially a genius now that he won a MacArthur uh, maybe six months ago, long overdue. Uh, so this is Project Row Houses in Action. These are some of the uh, houses that have been renovated, and those are our artist project spaces. There's also, uh, as was mentioned before, a space where, where single mothers live in an education program for a couple of years. They've built housing. They have 54 buildings now. So it is the, uh, and that's some of the housing that was built that was inspired uh, by the, the road houses. All right. So all that was, you know, sort of my thinking about how to run an art museum. And um, then at a certain point, I kind of got drafted to be the commissioner of cultural affairs. This is me with the mayor. By the way, I'm standing on a platform there. <laughs> <laughs> he's, seriously, he's got this uh, special podium. And when somebody who's not 6'5 gets it, he pushes the button, the little thing comes out. And he's standing up. Um, <laughs> So, so then, it's like, so, so I mean, the reason obviously that, that the mayor hired me was that, that 
a lot of what I was doing were consistent with this idea of this very progressive, you know, un unapologetically progressive agenda of this administration. So one of the things that we had to think about first is, you know, how do you make the argument that the arts are valuable? And one of the big arguments that had been made traditionally by many administrations, which is by the way, an argument that I continue to make, and I'm not turning my back on this argument at all, is that arts are good for the economy in a place like New York. You know, it's, there's a lot of tourism, we have, you know, all these, you know, tens of thousands of art related businesses, lots of jobs, big economic impact. It's bigger than our advertising in New York City, et cetera, et cetera. And, and again, absolutely valid. We have 56 million visitors coming to New York City this year. More than half of them come at least part because of the arts. And that is a really good argument for a place like Lincoln Center, which is, again, one of the cultural institutions group where we are the landlord. Um, it is not a good argument for the value of the Queens Museum or of a community-based arts practice. But there is another argument that's easily made that's quantifiable, and this is uh, there's a think tank at the University of Pennsylvania called the Social Impact of the Arts Project. And one of the things that they do is they map cities in relationship to artistic participation and social outcomes. So it's not, are we bringing tourists into the city? It's how are these kinds of organizations, especially the small scale organizations, impacting the life of the city? And so we have invited now the Social Impact of the Arts Project, Mark Stern and his team, to come to New York, it's funded privately, and they're gonna do an 18-month study to begin to understand that connection uh, in New York. So here's you know, one of his earliest maps that is beginning to look at uh, economic well-being uh, in New York City. So you can see, obviously, that you know, areas like downtown Manhattan and certain parts of Brooklyn, the uh, eastern edge of Queens are, extremely, are doing extremely well. Um, but how do you map diversity over uh, economic? Uh, you know, so, so you have the, these sort of areas in Manhattan which are quite um, uh, economically well off, but they're not that diverse. And so what, they, what happens with uh, Mark Stern and his project is that these maps get more and more and more complicated. And I love this map, which has to do with, this is Philadelphia now, where he's been studying for 20 years. Um, this idea that you could begin to map things like trust. And by the way, that's something that happens. If you look at, if you think about what happened, what was being built in all those events in Corona, uh, that moment when the Taiwanese women were, were learning Spanish? We're building trust and building connections across communities. Participation, trust, willing to work with neighbors. This is some of the stuff that happens if you can get diverse groups of people together, and the arts are a really good way to do that. And that's his whole argument, the social impact of the arts. Uh, and by the way, the role of artists in this, I think, is quite interesting. You think of everybody in this room has teaching artists working at your museum, right? And those teaching artists are working part-time, they're working at a community center over here, and they're doing their art practice, and they maybe are, are a, a preparator. And those are really interesting interconnectors. They create these very complex social network maps, which are good for communities. That's one of the reasons that art is, is good for the communities. So another way, again, you can see here's the mayor. And this is me not standing on a platform. So also kind of looking like a gangster, not far from here. Uh, this is the rollout of the municipal ID card. So in New York City, we have perhaps 500,000 people living here who are undocumented. Uh, that's a hard number to measure because they're undocumented. Um, but one of the things that the, the mayor promised in his campaign uh, was this sort of declaration of interconnection that we're going to be one city. And one way to do that was to launch the, the municipal ID card. So this ID card, there are ID cards like it in other cities. And, um, Oakland has it, there's a couple other places. The idea is you can get this card just by proving who you are and that you live in New York City. So I'm Tom Finkelpearl, I live in 85 South Street. I don't have to be here legally. I have to maybe have a passport from my former country, maybe I have my Con Ed bill or whatever. So I can prove who I am, I can get the card. The problem is that if only people who are undocumented get the card, then it's uh, you know the undocumented card. It's like, here, I'm undocumented, here's my document. So, 
In order to prevent that kind of uh, stigmatization, and by the way, here's some of the outreach. It's happening in a lot of different languages. Um, it's, you know, it's reaching to <coughs> different communities. But if you look at this particular text, it says, I use my ID NYC to visit my son in school. By the way, if you don't have government-issued identification, you can't visit your kid in school. So, you know, you're followed around if they let you in the door. It's just horrible. Um, but I mean, when I say horrible, I mean this is school safety is also important. But she says, and after I pick him up and we go to the zoos, museums, and botanical gardens with a free membership. So what we did was we went to the cultural institutions group, that group of city and institutions like the Brooklyn Museum, the Met, Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center. And we said, look, we've been giving you a lot of money since the 19th century. Maybe there'd be some way you can <laughs> get back to the city. And they said, all right, so why don't we, uh, and this was actually their idea, uh, actually spearheaded by the chairman of the Art Cultural Institution Group, Arnold Lehman. Um, so if you were to get your municipal ID, you could go to all these institutions, get $2,100 worth of free memberships. So this card has been this incredible sort of overwhelming success. It was a little bit tough in the rollout at the beginning. Um, the rollout was one of these things where we had looked at other cities and we said, well, 1% of Oakland got their ID card, so maybe in New York City it'll be 2% because we have all this great stuff. So, so far, I think 350,000 people have already signed. So we were expecting maybe 200,000 people in the first year. 350,000 have already signed up. And this is something where it was hard to sign up at first. Uh, and it's only been since January. So we're, we're expecting the possibility of 800, 900,000, even a million people to sign up for this card. And one of the reasons they're signing up for it is that it gets you into these fantastic cultural institutions and it no longer is the card for undocumented people. It's the card for New Yorkers. And I'm proud to be a New Yorker. I've got my card. I, by the way, I have it if anybody wants to see it. Um, and I have my first membership. So that's, that's this thing. And so, this is not a social art project or something like that. This is this idea that what we do in cultural institutions can interconnect with other things that the city is doing. Um, so one of the big worries that we have in New York City is that artists are going to go live in the cities where you guys work. And that would just be terrible for us. <laughs> Uh, my wife and I have a son who, who is in Omaha, uh, working at a wonderful uh, museum there this year. And we went there with him. We found an apartment in one afternoon, which is right near the kind of cool section of town, Dundee, if anybody's from o Omaha. And his rent was $460 a month for one bedroom. <laughs> that wasn't the most glamorous, but that took, I think, several hours to find. It's just that's how much apartments cost. And if anybody lives in New York, you know, it's, you know you're going to be paying $1,500 for one part of one room in a terrible apartment. So how, what are we going to do about that? And by the way, there have been a lot of stories in the paper about how uh, people are moving to L.A., right? Anybody from L.A. read those stories? Yeah. Well, it's also not true. Uh, <laughs> The fact is that people are moving to L.A., and in fact, the percentages are going up into other cities, but there's still more young people with college degrees moving to New York than any other American city. So if you look at the demographics, and I think the last good decade is 2003 to 2013, something like that, the plus in New York City in terms of people moving out versus moving in, of those under 30 to college degrees, 250,000. So that's still bigger, but we are worried and we are not taking it lightly, L.A. Um, no, because it's serious. I mean, look, the, the uh, real estate situation, the, the cultural community is growing in other cities. We have to be conscious of this, and it's just a quality of life question. So PS109, Artspace PS109, is the first dedicated live work uh, for artists, um, affordable housing built in New York City in a generation. And it shows you can do it. I have to say that this was... Uh, initiated and funded under the Bloomberg administration. Um, but we finished it, and we take taken credit. Um, we're also embracing the idea, no, oh, this was one of the great things. Bloomberg administration was really uh, dedicated to the idea that we have to keep artists in New York City. So we um, 
The mayor announced at the State of the City that we're going to build 1,500 units of live workspace for artists, affordable housing, as part of the overall 200,000 units of affordable housing that we're building, and so, and also 500 affordable studio spaces. So, 1,500 units of affordable housing is an important step. It is, at some level, symbolic, but 200,000 units of affordable housing isn't symbolic. That's enough, enough apartments for the entire city of Miami to live in, right? So we are dedicated to the idea of affordability for the city, and one of the groups that we think is important to keep in the city uh, and to keep here in an affordable way as artists. Um, another way that we work directly with artists, which is going to come under review, and be uh, modernized is the Percent for Art program where we you know, commission artists directly, and that's actually our only direct funding to individual artists. This is the public theater. I don't know if anybody's been in this. It's called the Shakespeare Machine, and there are these you know, blades and you know, Shakespeare quotes are uh, running on those blades. So that comes from our 1% for Art program. This is a library in Long Island City. So we're doing that. We want to modernize it. There's just been legislation that has increased community participation, uh, which, of course, we embraced at the Cultural Affairs Department. Um, but now I, I just want to sort of, as I kind of wrap up my statements, and I hope that you guys are, you, you did not seem like a shy group when you're talking to Arnold, so get ready to ask me some questions also, because this is my last little part of my spiel. Or actually, let me, let me, take, let me say one more thing before I get to this. So the, other, the, the actual number one um, cultural agenda of this administration is to revive quality, sequential arts education to the public school system of New York City. And that's extremely important. Arts education is overlooked all over the country. It's been really bad here in New York. Uh, and we have to, so the, the mayor dedicated $23 million of baseline additional funding for arts education in the budget. We've been working extensively with the Department of Education, and that's an exciting thing. But I didn't want to leave that out, because it's actually the most new money we've added to the arts. OK. Let's look at some demographics that Arnold was talking about. In, up until 1970, this is what America looked like, right? And we're going to get back to that slide a little bit later, because that's sort of what our profession looks like now. 25 years ago, the so-called minority population had increased to 20%. Today, in America, we are at 34%. And we're looking at becoming a so-called majority-minority country within the next 25 years, 20 years. Or 25 years will be 46%. 30 years on the line, I think it's going to be majority-minority. What do the core museum visitors look like today? We look like the country looked before 1970. And how about the workforce? It's the same. So I have a question. If excluding the culturally specific museums, so-called culturally specific, how many of you curators in this room work for an African-American director? None. OK, and that's true if everybody was here from all of the institutions in AAMD. How many work for an institution that has an African-American chief curator? One. OK? That's, I'd like to talk to you, because I didn't know there was one. <laughs> What's the museum? She retired. That's, I know, Lowry retired. What's that? It still counts. Well, OK. So by the way. OK. By the way, so somebody said, somebody got into an argument. What about Franklin Sermons? And said, first of all, he's not the chief curator. He's a, you know, he's a, runs a department. But if you're arguing about one person, <laughs> and if the one person raised their hand, meh. OK, so that's not, OK, so that, that's America, right? Let's look at US population. Let's look at New York City. New York City today is 65% people of color. So we're then going to do a survey. And the survey has been announced. And the survey will be required. We fund 1,000 groups. I mentioned that we fund the Cultural Institutions Group, but we also fund, uh, through tens of millions of other grants, another 1,000. 
So a thousand groups in New York City are going to send in their, be required, if they want to get any money from us, to send in a survey. And the survey is going to be about the staff, the board, the audience, if it's available. Uh, demographics are going to be race, gender, disability. Um, and we're going to do it with an outside consultant. Uh, the outside consultant will hold the information, so we're not going to be able to say, we're not going to ever see the information about a particular, you know, we're not going to know the demographics of the Met or the Brooklyn Museum or whatever. Um, but we are going to know by sector. So we're going to say, well, dance turns out to be, oops, oh, what happened? Hold on, I can do this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, dance is a little bit more diverse, I think, than the visual arts. I think music is more diverse than dance. But this is anecdotal. Um, and once we have the information, we're going to take some kind of policy action. But what we're doing already, we had a big um, rollout at the Ford Foundation. We have a bunch of foundations and corporations backing it up, is to begin to share best practices. And anybody a football fan here? <laughs> Anybody a football fan who works at a museum with an African American director? <laughs> okay, so the so you might know uh, something called the Rooney Rule. Do you know the Rooney Rule? Okay, what is the Rooney Rule? Yes, for every. General manager or coach, head coach. And general manager is like the director, and the head coach is like the chief curator, right? Um, right, no, you know, as a football fan, you know that's true. Um, so the Rooney Rule has been moderately successful. It was started by a guy named Rooney at the Pittsburgh Steelers. They hired Bobby Tomlin, he won the Super Bowl a couple of years later. It was very successful. Since that has been enacted, they've doubled. This is, by the way, like New York City, they have a majority-minority league, right? I think 75% of the league is people of color in terms of the players. So there's no lack of you know, people there who are involved in, in football who are people of color. So it's doubled the number of uh, black head coaches and general managers, black and Latino. So I instituted that role at the Queens Museum. Every single job, aside from maintenance and security, by the way, maintenance and security was already very diverse as it is at your museum. Um, so every single person who is in the education, curatorial, public events, uh, department, administration, et cetera, there had to be a person of color interviewed as a finalist for every single job. Now, that is affirmative action. I did not say we're going to hire people of, every, of color for every job. And once you're in the room, it's up to you. You're on your own. So that's a simple rule which resulted in a, uh, a workforce at the Queens Museum that was more than 50% people of color. And, that, and by the time I left, the three heads of the different departments, which were curatorial, public events, and uh, Education were people of color living in Queens, by the way, which meant a lot to me as well. So it can be done. They're, they're, one of the things that we've been talking a lot about um, in this survey is the whole question of the pipeline, right? So, well, you know, how many people with PhDs coming out of schools, you know, in decorative arts are people of color, right? So first of all, there's this question. So if you know that the answer is to the question, is everybody's white, then maybe you're asking the wrong question. And one of the things that I feel is <clears throat> that there are other kinds of expertise that need to be appreciated at museums, for example, community organizers. I was talking about this pipeline question with a woman who runs social media for the NAACP, and you know, they said there's not, people are always saying, well, you know, uh, low-income families and families of color don't want their kids to go into the arts because you're not going to make enough money, right? And she said, well, what about community organizers and, and public school teachers and social workers? Those are very diverse professions because, she said, those are professions where it is explicitly understood that you're giving back to the community by doing it. So those folks were willing to do that, are willing to do that, 
but not for this profession, which doesn't seem like you would be giving back to the community. I thought that was a really interesting analysis. I don't know, I mean, that was one person's opinion, but one person who's spent her adult life thinking about this kind of stuff. So we are interested in understanding pipeline questions. I had a meeting with the chancellor of CUNY. CUNY is the great public education system here in New York City. Hunter College, Queens College, Brooklyn College. The undergraduate body looks like New York City. The graduate programs in arts administration and art history don't. So how are we going to make, break that barrier? And I'll say one more thing and then we'll get some questions, uh, which is that we did have one, I'd say, successful pipeline initiative at the Queens Museum, which was a diversity initiative within curatorial. And uh, starting curatorial, then it, it branched out a bit. So the idea was it was a fellowship. You know, everybody has unpaid internships, and it's hard to get diverse candidates for unpaid paid internships. So we went to a couple of foundations, and we said, we would like to have a $10,000 internship, or fellowship. Uh, we did a part-time job. It's not a real job, but we're gonna, it's going to be a diversity fellowship. And the person who gets this job will not only work in the curatorial department part-time for a year, but also do a project. So by the end of the year, they will have organized a, a, a small exhibition. They will have done something or, or an education program, and that has their name on it. And we had three a year, and every one of those people has jobs. So they were, the thing is that they were college graduates already. They were ready to enter the workforce. And there's something that happens all the time in all businesses, but in, I've seen it happen in museums over and over again, which is, oh my god, so-and-so is leaving. What are we going to do? Oh, there's this fantastic intern. You know, she's been here, the girl from Smith, and she's been here for you know, six months already. She knows the place, let's just hire her, right? So we had those people, they were in the museum, and they were diversity fellows. So we hired some of them, and they were ready to go. So it's, it's just an example of the kind of thing we're thinking about. It'll be interesting to see what happens with Arnold and what they're doing at Ford. But it's time, we can't continue to have this situation where we're sitting in a room like this and we're lamenting. Everybody in this room, every museum in this room has the opportunity to create your own pipeline program, to look carefully at your hiring practices, to institute the Rooney Rule or whatever you want to do. It can happen. And I'm really hoping everybody here isn't mad at me saying that. <laughs> So that's what I'd say, and then I want to get some questions. <clears throat> There's a. Hi, my name is Mary Kay Lombino. I'm a curator at Vassar College at the Art Museum there. Um, we use New York City a lot. Every Friday, students don't have classes, but they have field trips to the city. And so when they graduate, they all want to move here. And uh, just, and we have a hugely diverse population of students, believe it or not. Vassar just won an award for the most um, sort of rapid change in terms of student body because of scholarships. And I want to go back to this idea of housing for artists and for young people in the city. And I'm wondering if you've had any ideas about collaborating with some of the more powerful businesses, like Two Trees Management, for instance. Um, they developed Dumbo, and now they're developing the Domino Sugar Building. And um, people are worried that that's going to take away affordable housing. So I'm wondering if there's a way that you're able to collaborate with them before those buildings are built and... So you know that there was a big controversy about that. I do. So by the way, one of those bachelor students moved into our building upstairs, so. <laughs> um, but that was his parents' loft, right? Um, so the controversy at Two Trees with the domino, there was a, it was all over the papers. I don't want to rehearse that. But it was this idea that the, uh, there was already some affordable housing in there. And the city, meaning the Blasio administration, said, okay, hold on, we're here now, we're going to make their, uh, them add additional affordable housing, which eventually, after back and forth and back and forth, happened. And I have to say there was a lot of bad blood in the paper, 
but we're, I think, on much better terms with Two Trees right now. We've been collaborating with them on some other stuff. So I think at the, you know, one of the things that's happened under de Blasio is that there were always these tax incentives for affordable housing, but they were voluntary. So if you want to build higher, then you will be, you know, you'll get a tax break and you'll have to build some affordable housing. So what, what's happened under this administration has said, anytime it's Euler, which is a land use change, you have to build affordable housing. Not you might want to, and here's a tax break. So there's, you know, there's already a lot, there's a first year um, report about affordable housing, and I think that the 20,000 units have already been achieved. But you know, it's a tough situation in a, in, a, in a city where people are coming and the population is growing. And you know, it's a good problem to have. When I moved to New York City, it was affordable housing because people were leaving. You know, there are a lot of cities out there that have a lot of empty property. So um, it's a complex thing. It's not my, uh, I'm not, I don't build housing. Um, uh, but we, the administration is dedicated to that, making it a livable city. And there are you know, all kinds of other initiatives. But whatever, yeah, we're working with Two Trees. Uh, we did work on that particular site with Two Trees. I'm completely aware of the problem. And you know, when I, when I came out of college, it was 1979. New York City was a very dangerous place to work, to live. I mean, whatever, 3,000 people were getting murdered, right? So it was 10 people a day or something like that. Now it's, you know, we're very happy that only one person a day gets murdered, right? It's great. Um, so it's, been, it's the safest big city in America. You know, it's but one of the problems with that becoming safer, you know, is that it becomes a more desirable place to, to live. And, you know, the big change in New York City, people have all these ideas about what it was, but I believe was the change in immigration laws that opened the doors. You know, so 1965 was the Heart Seller Act. It was changed immigration in America. By the 70s, the city was beginning to refill with immigrants. And this is something that, uh, you know, various urban historians have talked about, that the real re-urbanization of America is not affluent people moving back to the city because they think it's cool. It's immigration. Certainly that's the case in New York City. So when you think about affordability and you think about your master students moving here, you have to think about affordability also for those immigrant families and why are they coming and how are they coming, where are they living, and how is it affordable for them. So there's something like the ID card makes New York City more livable, both for the not rich, young, Vassar graduate and for the undocumented person who's living with 10 people in a small apartment in Queens. I don't know if that answers the question. Somebody over there was tentatively, oh, okay. My name's Emily Beanie, and I'm an associate curator at the Norton Simon Museum. Um, it was so inspiring to hear about these, these social art projects and your community engagement through contemporary art projects at the Queens Museum. Um, but if we are moving away from an object-based paradigm for museums, where does that leave those of us who are entrusted with collections of objects, impressionist paintings, and other similarly unfashionable things. Is Do you have the advice for us? Went to? Is that the museum that Kehande Wiley? Yeah. Oh. I, I thought I had a really good answer, but then. I, <laughs> I mean, I think at the. Um, I was, I had the great honor of interviewing the Brazilian educational theorist, Paulo Freire, before he died. And uh, we were talking about, actually about kind of social art and this and that. And he said, but you know, you don't have to, in order to make kind of social connection, uh, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be political art. And so he, he pointed to a, a painting on the wall it was just a beautiful flower of a, paint, a painting of a flower. And he said, you know, this is a very beautiful work of art, but what I like to do when I think about a sort of education or, you know, his whole conscientization, the idea of creating social consciousness through dialogue, uh, was to say something like, if you look at beauty, you know, so who has access to beauty and how do they have access to beauty? And so if you have it, so there could be an object 
there's just a beautiful object that's a painting of a flower. And that can raise all kinds of other questions that can create consciousness. So if you have, I'm not saying that objects are unimportant. And I, I love to walk around museums and look at objects. But the question is how you frame it and where is the interactive moment happening, with whom, under what circumstances. So I think it, for, uh, for collections, you know, that, that sort of lesson from, for that, that Paula Freire said, just a who has access to beauty question and why. If you ask people that question, I think it'd be interesting. But, and the other thing is, you know, education departments have been doing this stuff for a long time. And the question is, how can you know, the curators in this room work closely with education to understand those interactive possibilities? We have a couple of minutes left, or we could take a break. <laughs> There's her. Hi, Mara Gladstone from the Palm Springs Art Museum. Um, you started your talk um, that it was hard to get people to Queens. I'm wondering, did you have any transportation initiatives hmm. or partnerships to get people there? We have a museum in the middle of the desert, and um, <laughs> <laughs> you get there, but the public transportation for the people sort of further out in the valleys. Yeah, you know, whenever you think you have it bad, you meet somebody else. Uh, so, I mean, the subway comes nearby. And the thing is that, so we had to find people who didn't think it was hard to get there. That's what I was saying. In other words, there are 2.2 million people in Queens, vastly undercounted. We think it was higher than that. But so um, there are people right nearby. There's a park that's one of the most used parks in New York City that we're in. So it wasn't a matter of it being hard to get there for everybody. It had to be, it was hard to get there for the people we thought should be getting there. It's the same thing Arnold was saying. You know, the competition in New York is ridiculous. If you're waking up in the morning and it's just as easy to get to the matter, you know, Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim, the New Museum, are you going to go to Queens? If, it's, if there's something happening at the Queens Museum, and it's nearby, and it's your place, and you've been there a million times, and you know how to, you know, not just how to get there physically, but how to get in the door and understand how much it doesn't cost. You know, it's a voluntary contribution, but they, we were only asking for $5 and then went up to $8. So, and you understand, you know, every Sunday, every Sunday afternoon, there's free programming for families, that kind of stuff that over and over and over again reinforced that it's, this place is for you. Then for those people, it wasn't hard to get there. So we did do buses, and I thought it was a bad idea, and I canceled them. We had, because the idea is if you think it's so hard to get to the Queen's Museum that you have to go on a special bus that's charged for the opening, you're never going to come back. And especially if there happens to be bad traffic on that day, it will reinforce, which there is often, um, it'll reinforce that, that mistaken idea that for everybody it's hard to get to. Now, being in the middle of the desert is a whole other thing, so I have no answer to your question. <laughs> So actually, there's only two minutes left. So should I just, that's it? Or is there one more? OK, all right, that's it. Hi. Um, Where? Uh, over here. Oh, yeah, OK. Hi. Uh, I'm Anna Marley, and I'm from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. We're a smaller museum, and we are interested in, in creating a diversity fellowship. We have a private patron who wants to help fund it. Um, but that might be funding for one fellowship for a few years uh, and not possible to sustain. As now a funder yourself and someone who's on the other side, how do you suggest um, muse a museum like us who doesn't have any Mellon funding or Ford funding, is not on that kind of network, uh, you know, we, we don't want to just continue to have free or unpaid un internships. We do want to try to move the field forward. Do you have suggestions for funding? Well, I mean, first of all, if you have the opportunity to do it for several years, that's great. You know, we actually, we were funded by New York Community Trust at the beginning, and they, they actually, while well, they said, oh, this is a successful program, they said, we want to fund whatever, another thing at the museum. So we went to Agnes Gund, and she's been funding it since then. So, you know, you can change funders. If you can get it going, and what I would recommend, having done it, is that you do just a one-year fellowship. So you do that, that could help three different people if it's three years. Get somebody, you know, that credential instead of having one person do that for three years. But, you know, that's completely 
I always say, don't listen to me. You have to listen to other <laughs> multiple people. But you know, if you can get it started uh, and learn from your experience, you might find other funders, and or even you might just you know launch three people into that. That'd be great. So I would you know look at the uh, bright side. I mean, if you have a small, how many people on your staff? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, that's big. Okay, that's not small. Um, <laughs> Yeah, 30, okay. So in any case, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you should just go for it. You should uh, make sure that you really, um, you know, get the word out and get really great people at the beginning. You know, you have your pick of Philadelphia right now. Uh, I know there's a lot of people coming out of wonderful schools there. But I mean, my, and my recommendation is if you get people at the point of, in their life where they're ready to be hired. Um, by the way, we had one of our fellows who was from Philadelphia. Fantastic uh, woman. In any case, that's getting a little bit into the weeds, I guess. Uh, but, and I do, you know, I love museums, I love objects, I love curators. <laughs> and I'm getting a call, so thanks. When Judith and I approached Tom about, I guess it was a year ago, um, I kept thinking there's no way that he will make time for us. He has to be the busiest person in New York. And I think within two seconds he wrote back and said that he would love to be with us today. And he's um, shared his time with us um, very, very generously. So thank you, Tom, for that. Thank you.